Hey everyone, now you may remember this building behind me from a previous video last year. Yep, yeah, this is the home of pinned Scottish made pedals and now some other parts as well. I've been invited back because this week they have a new product coming out. They are branching out into the world of crank arms and specifically e-bike crank arms. They're one of the few brands I've seen that are really experimenting with shorter crank arm lengths. They're even going down to 145 mil, which has quite a few advantages for an e-bike. I'm excited, it's cold. Let's jump in here, meet their new designer and find out more about these cranks. Hey everyone, so we have headed inside now and I have Sam here who, have you been the lead designer for, yep. the, for the new crank? So if we need to know anything about the cranks, Sam here is the guy to ask and to show us. Uh, obviously we've got the pedals and we were thinking we want to move, as pinned, we want to move out from the pedals across different parts of the bike. We were looking at e-bikes specifically because it felt like a good place to start. Um, and do you guys ride e-bikes yourselves? Is that one reason why it was a decision? Yeah, Jamie's big into his e-bikes and <laughs> all of his mates are uh, like racing. When the first idea came and we were like, okay, let's do e-bike cranks. We were thinking of, you know, how do we make them good ground clearance? How do we make them light? How do we make them stiff? How do we make them strong enough? And how do we verify all these things? The general trend seems to be that crank lengths have keep getting shorter and with e-bikes, that makes even more sense because you're having a motor help you when you need that extra little bit of torque to get over a step. You've got the assistance of a motor. Sure. And especially if you're racing uh, e-enduro or whatever. So that's why we're offering one, four, five millimeter crank lengths uh, for the e-bike cranks. Is that the shortest length on the market? Is there anyone like, I've as not far seen... as I know, yeah, as far as I know for e-bike cranks, yeah, it's the shortest, shortest on the market. I mean, you're definitely the first I've seen. I think it's really interesting to experiment with this because one advantage I'm sure would be if you're pedaling up a tech climb, mm. you don't want to stop pedaling. Yeah. And shorter cranks, surely you're going to have fewer pedal strikes as well. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, in these e-bike races as well, some of them have those steep tech climbs in them. Oh, so they look nuts. <laughs> you want to keep, keep, the, keep the crank spinning. And the other nicer thing about having a shorter crank is there's less material. So you're carrying less weight and you can optimize it better for that sort of weight strength and weight stiffness. Yeah, so there's the, the sort of different design elements going on and a lot, of them, a lot of the way that this has been designed, it's not just made to look good, it's because we think it adds some sort of functionality. Mm -hmm. For example, this cut out here, it's nice to get the logo away from the heel so the logo stays nice and fresh. These side chamfers, we want to make sure that when you do hit it off anything that it deflects nicely, it doesn't catch. Nice. Um, but then also that lends itself to quite a nice pleasing finish. We can we can keep those machine lines on so you can see that it's been CNC'd uh, and that sort of carries across with the, the pedals as well. Yeah, we yeah. wanted them to look like they're related to each other. It's definitely a good looker. That's a real nice crank. So the earlier iterations would have been quite blocky just with the basic design elements that were required and then the software can help me say, all right, you can shave material off there to achieve this minimum weight or achieve so this. So just help you uh, optimize it. Yeah, to help, to help you optimize it. And that's, that's where this shapes come from the back um, to, remove, to remove the weight, but also keep it as stiff as we can do it and strong enough, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so these are the Bosch ones. So they'll fit anything with an ISIS uh, axle that's specifically designed for the Bosch Gen 3 motors. They'll also go on Yamaha motor drives as well. Okay. Yeah, so we've, we've been looking at the, Sh the Shimano EP8 and making some compatible cranks with that. Uh, but yeah, so the, the, the design of the crank is, is pretty simple really, but it's, um, it's a self-extracting mechanism. So it's just eight mil Allen key to put them on, eight mil Allen key to put them off. This is sort of an exaggerated view of um, the crank under the load of pedaling. If you can imagine that with an axle through it and a force going through that axle, that's the way the crank is gonna sure. gonna move about. So it's a really handy tool for making sure that the design's good enough. With these ones, we've sent them to an independent testing lab in Germany to get verified um, for category four use, which is um, enduro use. And so they do uh, a few different types of tests on them. One of them being fatigue tests, and then 
at an overload test and a max load test. They don't do an impact test on them, but the overload test is sort of the equivalent because you're loading it sure. above and beyond yeah, what you would yeah. typically receive to your crank car. As we as we go, we're sort of learning things, and with the Bosch cranks, we this this sort of cutout area, it's it's really good for stiffness. But with the Shimano one, you're obviously going to have your extra hardware here and that's going to add to the weight of the whole system. So I wanted to remove extra weight from this crank arm and I found that at a small sacrifice for a little bit of stiffness we could use this sort of scooping cutout along the back side of the crank. Because you're doing short cranks, what length have you been testing? Like you suggested earlier, 145 is going to be much more stable than 165. It's just less, less of a lever. So all the cranks that we test, we'll test the longest length that we stock them in to that make sure sense. that they're strong enough. Colour-wise though, mm -hmm. I think a nicely subtle way of doing it is that you can't get the cranks in any wild colours, but I've noticed there the bolts you've got on. That's what we want to do, we want to offer them as silver and black, and then you can add on a mix and match of the captive nut and your crank bolt. So, if you think about it, there's eight different colours and two different bolts there, plus the different colours of the crank. Have you done the maths? Because really, I can't do that maths. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a lot of maths. <laughs> so having worked in a shop that sold hundreds of different anodized bike components, it's quite easy to get carried away and just try and colour coordinate, coordinate your bike far too much and end up making it look like a, a crazy clown rainbow. I think it's actually a real nice subtle way to add some colour coordination to your bike without going overkill. 3D printer, the same printer that I've got. It looks like you've been busy with it. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Yeah, it's a pretty good tool for pro prototyping stuff, and obviously we've got machines out there, but you still need to have a fixture, and you need to have the drawings looked at, um, so it just takes longer to cut stuff into metal. So if we're checking something like for this crank, like just clearances and everything like that, um, then a 3D print is actually just pretty good for that. Oh, is that Shimano e EP8 motor? I think this is an EP8, yeah. Nice can offer that up and sort of give it a spin, yeah, see yeah. everything works. I wouldn't hop on it, but <laughs> <laughs> we've also been working on some derailleur hangers and axles, so pretty pretty small parts, but if you like the other colours and stuff, then maybe you'll want to spruce up your bike with these type of things. It's a small thing really, but just adding these sort of Ooh. nice grooves in there, that is gorgeous. and that could be an option versus the just plain finish on the other one. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So I guess it keeps the brand, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it sort of keeps the family of the products and aligns with that, I guess. Yeah. There are the crank arms ready to be shipped out. Oh, oh so these are 145s. Oh, they look, they look so teeny. <laughs> just grabbed a couple of crank arms here just so you can see a bit of a difference in the lengths. Yeah, that one is absolutely tiny. Look how much extra clearance you're going to get there. Yeah, so maybe coming soon, some stem spaces and a nice top cap. Oh, yeah. There's sort of smaller projects going on, uh, and then we've got like the bigger stuff working on as well. So it's quite watch exciting. this space. Yeah, watch this space. Working on lots of different things. So keeping you busy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so moving on, this isn't technically about the cranks, but I'm still using their pedals after a year with no issues at all. And one way they can tell. The strength of the pedals is with this contraption here. This is like the Shin's Revenge. This is sort of a te this test rig that we've uh, designed and built. Uh, there's three different tests we can do on here. One of them, which is this thing, this is the impact test. So these slide up and down. It's mounted right here at the moment for one of the fatigue tests. The pedal spins in the bearing. A motor loads in from the other side and make sure the axle spins with the pedal while we use this to hang weight off it. Then the other test we do is just on the pushing below that. The pedal doesn't spin or anything. We just look, put as much weight as we can on the pedal, uh, load it up for a minute and we'll take it off. What, what we want to know is we want to know where are our pedals, what type of load causes permanent deformation and also whether they're going to be bending or cracking because if you do damage a pedal let's say you case jump really bad you smack it off a rock then you want it to bend 
you don't want to lose your foot and drop out. So that's the type of things we're looking at. We're also looking at what type of damage repairs. So weighing things up that way. Have you tried any other brand's pedals on this to see how yours like, fare up against them? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have. Uh, that's a big smile. So they fare up fairly well then. You happy yeah. with the results? We're, we're pleased. Obviously, we, we always think that we can improve things. So maybe um, maybe in the future you'll see updated CS2 pedals. But we are happy with the, the product as it is. It's interesting for us as well to compare the beryllium copper axles versus the titanium ones as well as the new stainless ones yeah. uh, and seeing how they all they all stack up against each other. I'm glad I'm not a pedal. <laughs> and there's another machine here which wasn't here last time I was visiting. No, not some new stuff. This is a laser engraving machine. So we used to get things done, we'd send them away and then they'd come back nicely marked for us. We just want to bring everything in house where we can. For Ali we put his logo on the side of the these purple pedals for him earlier. So that's just showing me where those uh, those lines, where your logo is going to be marked on it. With this fixture, because I know I'm not going to be doing a lot of these, I just gonna, I just line it up by eye. It'll be pretty quick, but you ready? There we go. Thank you. finish on that. So we'll just load, we side load the pedals into the side of the fixture and once that's loaded in there we use the pins to secure it on the underside and that allows us to mark the, the logos on nice and securely and get it done the same way every time. You pop that on and then again have the pin logo where it's supposed to be and in order to mark it you close the door, press pedal Nice. Takes a couple of seconds. It is so quick. I couldn't believe how quick it was. So I've shown you how the cranks are designed. Now we're back into the heart of this facility. All the massive machines which you might remember from last time. But now they've got some new ones and this is where the cranks are made. We're gonna find Jamie, who you may remember from last time, to hopefully take us through some of the process it takes to make these cranks. This is a pretty fancy new machine you got here. Yeah, this is a four axis horizontal machine with uh, 15 pallets on it. The advantage of making the cranks on this machine is you can do multiple cranks at the same time. So the machines we saw last time, which are up there, they're five axis? Is yeah, they're right? five axis ones. What's the advantage or disadvantage to making the cranks on this machine? So the, that one? there's a couple of advantages. Um, first of all, you can see the spindle is not up top with five axis on its side. Um, machines all, all the swarf just falls away from the job, so you don't get any swarf issues. Also, you can put the multiple parts. Your uh, cycle time is reduced because the amount of time it takes the tool change from the five-axis machine. It's got quite a distance to travel every time it wants the tool change. On this, it's a very short distance. It's only from where you see right now. It's up near the guard there. That's it. Oh, yeah. so it's, it's short, and then you're. The tool change is actually divided by the amount of parts you've got on, on the table at the same time, so it is a lot faster. And how long does it take to do a crank arm? Um, the Bosch ones were about 25 minutes per side. That's quite side. quick. Yeah, yeah. No, that's super quick. Yeah. But when this, this machine doesn't hang about. No. How long does it take you to like, work out a new machine like this? Quite a while. <laughs> you just get used to working the same machine. Because I'm based in the office all the time, I'm on my ear every now and then. <laughs> It kind of looks like rocket science, but you do make stuff that goes into space for rocket yeah. science, so... Yep, that's the core business. Yeah. So this is uh, the first operation, so obviously we uh, put a, a fresh block in there. So we do this operation in the eight places around the tombstone. So we're going as a solid block, I'll we'll machine it complete to this stage. So this whole face is finished, the two bores are finished, but the outside is not finished yet, we'll finish that in the secondary operation. So on the secondary operation, we will have a fixture that looks something like this, and it will locate on the, the two bores. Um, so one of them will locate in there and one of them will locate in there, and that will bolt onto one of the positions on the tombstone. 
and we'll just finish it off. So obviously the Shimano one's just going through the prototype stage. It's one of the wash ones here. So I've done, done exactly the same way that way first. When we flip it around, it's the wrong fixture for it, but we put it on the fixture like so. Yep. And then I'll machine the rest of it complete. And then I'll be ready for getting splined. This is going in for splining, so at the moment that's just blank. And then we'll use two different tools to put the spline on. So we've got the one at the back, which we'll use for roughing the spline. So that comes in and out very fast. Um, so it's a wee bit quicker for roughing it. And then we'll use this one um, for finishing the spline, because we'll have to taper in three axes to be able to do this spline. So. So this is the, the carbide insert we use for doing the splines. So it's a custom insert um, that I don't know if you'll be able to see that. It's basically to the shape. Oh yeah. To the shape of the spline. So just a tiny little bit of carbide. Yeah. That's all that makes up. It's really cool that you're so involved because you are designing products that are then getting made literally in the next room. Yeah. It's got to be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'll come up with stuff and then I'll come through and talk to chat to Jamie and Greg and the other programmers and we'll, we'll sort of be like, how can I make this so it's easy for us to make it? And uh, it's not so it's not just me sending a drawing to someone in another country or whatever and being completely disconnected from the problems of manufacturing it. You know, the conversation, we have the conversation very quickly, how are we going to make it? And it's very, that means it's, it's, it's really useful for us, for me, to learn things about how to design stuff in a way so it can be manufactured. And for you, so I don't give you something that's a pain in the arse, basically. Yeah, very much, yeah. I can imagine it speeds things up so much as well. Yeah, it does work quite well, because when we're actually making the parts, we get Sam out and say, right, here you go, what do you think? We go, oh, no, we need to change this, we need to change that. And it can be done quite quick, so yeah, yeah. it's really, really good, it works well. So here's something you guys didn't have last time. Yep. This looks pretty futuristic. Yeah, it's basically a scanning machine for uh, measurement. So we can scan the part and it'll tell you what its size is and if it's in spec or out of spec. And it does it in seconds. And for quality control mainly. Um, so when you get the part from off the machine, you can come put it on here. Um, run it through, check the size are alright. If it's good, the inspectors can see the data from that run and they can look at it and verify it. Yeah, yeah. And then all the way throughout that run, we can see if it's moving about and the size are moving. So it's good for our uh, control as well. And now when it's going up and down, that's the check in the thread. So you don't need to use a thread gauge for it. You can do it on this. So you can see the results there. Yeah, everything's pretty much green. We've got a couple of issues on the thread there. So the guys that can go and attend to that and make it right. So it literally colour codes yeah. errors. Nice. It'll let you know how how close you are to being out of spec as well. No way. So that gives you a bit of an idea on how these new cranks are made and yeah, like last time I came here, it's a pretty interesting process. But now the interesting thing for me is on this table here because I'm not just here to look at some machines, I'm here to collect some products as well. I'm not sure if you saw but I am now officially signed with Pinned and I couldn't be happier because I've been using their pedals for the last year and haven't had a single issue and I've only had one shinner as well but that's that's all I need. Now I did post on my Instagram the other day a sneak peek of my yellow hex with purple brake and a few people have said what about purple pedals? Well, say that fast five times. Look what I've got here. Oh, these are in the process of getting built up now and I think these will be a perfect match for, the, match for the hex. And of course I'll have the mountain bikes ready soon so a bunch of pedals here being built up as well. Now one of my bikes is an e-bike, but it does use a Shimano system. So I've been told by Jamie that as soon as those Shimano cranks become available, I should be getting a pair. I'm, I'm actually genuinely excited to try some short cranks. Okay, so important, we've been talking about these cranks. When and where are these cranks available from? They're uh, ready to pre-order now, but they will be available on Wednesday. Okay, so by the time this video is out, these cranks will be available. <laughs> Go treat yourself, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me back. 
You too. It's good to meet some new faces Brilliant. and some old faces. Good to, see good to see some new machinery. Good to see some new products as well. Thank you so much for my goodies. I'll get these fitted to my bikes as soon as possible. But yeah, I really appreciate the tour. Nice one. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.